Welcome to our online worship service here at Idlewild Community Church. It's the first Sunday of a new year. And for me, that has included several days of trying to recover from a respiratory infection. And as you can hear, I'm still kind of in that process. But there's no place that I would rather be to start the new year. King David felt that same kind of way when in Psalm 27 he declares, One thing have I asked from the Lord, that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. So when, and he also then in that Psalm 27 says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So let's join our hearts as together we seek the Lord together in this new year.
Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. We thank you for the workers you are providing and pray you will continue to bring them. We pray for those overseeing and serving at the thrift shop. A grandson with a sunken chest had surgery recently to remove upper torso supports. He is recovering very well, and we praise you. We pray for his bones to remain where you always intended them to be from now on. A husband had successful knee replacement surgery. We pray for therapy to be completed and for his mobility and strength to be restored. We lift up our life group ministry and praise you for the participants. We pray you would grow this ministry. Lord, we praise you for your son and for his birth, sacrifice, and resurrection. We praise you for sending him to us so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. As we start this new year, we pray for your Spirit's guidance and presence for our prayer and fasting this month. May we follow your leading, relying on you more and more throughout this year. A visitor needs work and community. There are family issues as well. We pray for you to provide for her and her family. Her niece returned to high school last week following an episode of gun violence at the school. We pray for wisdom for law enforcement and school leadership and safety and peace of mind for students and staff. The son of former members has been diagnosed with stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver. We pray for healing and wholeness. Several members are fighting cancer. We pray for the cancers to be eradicated. We pray for you as the great physician to bring healing and restoration. We lift up the countries of Ukraine and Israel. We pray for the hostilities between Russia and Ukraine and between Israel and Hamas to end as soon as possible and for hostages to be returned safely and for a lasting peace to be negotiated. We lift up the local art school. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you and love you more deeply. We thank you for the families and members that attend our church and pray for additional families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up our couples and singles and we pray for you to draw each person near to you and near to one another. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for you to raise up leaders who have the wisdom, desire, faith, and courage to guide this nation according to your will, returning us to living by the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. We pray for revival to spread across our country and the world. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your Son to be drawn near and near to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. And we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture upon which the message uh, comes is from Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, it says this. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all of the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree in which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And the vineyard keeper answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. So we continue in our series of looking at the book of Luke as we look into Luke. Uh, but we do this seeking, first of all, an understanding of what happened in Jesus' earthly ministry, yes, but even more importantly for us to ask which portion, uh, which, what is it in each portion of Luke that Jesus wants us to, to pull out and use as a template for today? Well, the portion of Scripture that I just read contains a parable that you will only find in the Gospel of Luke. Now, sometimes when Jesus tells a parable, it's sort of a standalone truth. For instance, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus strings several parables together like pearls on a strand to give sort of kingdom wisdom. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And let me look at it from different types of, of angles, but they're standalone truths. But there are other times when Jesus tells a parable that's in response to something, be it an event or an interaction. So an example of this would be the three parables that Jesus gives in Luke 15, back to back to back, of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son, uh, the prodigal son. And they're all told in response to something in response to the harsh and judgmental attitudes that religious leaders had toward the irreligious. Well, the scripture that I just read, it includes this lesser-known parable of Jesus that he tells in an attempt to, to counter a popular belief concerning uh, why tragedies happen, as well as Jesus pleading with people, you and me, to repent. As we noted last week, Jesus drew immense crowds. He healed them. He taught them. But there were no real set rules or official protocol uh, for these immense gatherings. They were just so unique. So last week we saw how someone in the crowd, right in the middle of, uh, of a sentence, interrupts Jesus' flow of thought. And he's demanding, Jesus, you need to assist me in getting an inheritance that I feel I've been cheated out of. Well, Jesus addresses the motive behind that interrupter's demand, and he tells a parable, the parable of the rich fool. But the interruptions haven't come to an end from this particular crowd. Again, verse 1. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So there had been two mass tragedies that had recently occurred uh, in Israel, and they were still fresh in the thinking and in the hearts of those even who were listening to Jesus on this occasion. And there were some folks in the crowd who wanted to know what Jesus thought about these two mass uh, tragedies. The first was a massacre of Galilean pilgrims who were offering sacrifices in Jerusalem. And for reasons we don't know, Pilate, the, the Roman governor, he gruesomely had them all butchered. And so the crowd wants to know, Jesus, what's your take on this terrible tragedy? I mean, I mean when's God going to do something about the brutality of the Romans? Or, or actually, maybe the Romans were the instrument of, in God's hand to have judgment on these sinful Galileans. They were more sinful than the rest. What do you think, Jesus? And the scripture says, And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners 
than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Jesus suspects that the folks that are bringing up this issue subscribe to a kind of popular folk theology that's akin to what in our day is floated around and called karma. That there's this direct connection between your actions and your experience. And so if you're suffering, it means you've done something wrong. It's coming back around to you. Job's three friends in the Old Testament, they came like spiritual prosecutors, pressing Job. You're suffering. You're suffering badly. So you must have done something terribly wrong. So just admit it. Confession is good for the soul. Come on, what is it? Well, Jesus is asking, did these Galileans deserve to be brutally murdered? He's going to answer that question, but answer it in a way that will cut across the grain of popular thought. He says, I tell you, no. They didn't do anything to deserve this terrible fate. But it's here that Jesus goes unexpectedly from just the the theoretical to the deeply personal. See, he's not going to justify his position with well-honed argument after argument saying this is why they didn't deserve it. Instead, what he does, Jesus just lowers the boom on everyone who is listening to him in that massive crowd as well as anyone who is listening to him today. He says, were these Galileans greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I mean, you want to talk about just this left hook that comes out of nowhere, slants square on your jaw. Folks in the crowd, they're asking Jesus what he thinks about a terrible massacre. And Jesus says, unless you repent, you'll share the same kind of fate. So Jesus then continues by pointing out a second tragedy, a recent tragedy that occurred. He said, do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and and killed them were worse culprits than all other men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Evidently, there was a a wall, a section of a wall that just collapsed with terrifying suddenness, just crushing 18 hapless people who had to be nearby. So here you got two instances, recent instances of high-profile catastrophes. One was a state-sanctioned massacre. The other is just this freak accident that could have killed anyone who was walking by the time when the wall fell. Both talk about life being snuffed out without warning. And in both instances, Jesus issues the same sober warning. I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So the issue here is not for, you know, for Jesus. It's not to affix blame when tragedy occurs. The issue for Jesus is this. It's our desperate need to live lives of continual uh, repentance. Because Jesus knows something that we're going to get to in a moment. But he's going to tell a parable to drive home his point that repentance is desperately needed. He says, a man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and he did not find any. Now, this was a tree that had every advantage. It was planted in the very best soil this farmer had on his acreage. That would be the vineyard. And he comes looking for fruit and he voices frustration with his chief gardener. He says, behold, for three years, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? This fig tree is drawing nutrients from the soil and it's impacting the surrounding plants that are yielding some fruit. It's limited because all those nutrients are being sucked up by this fig tree that's not producing anything. Just cut it down. No one would blame the owner for this pronouncement of doom 
on a fruit tree that's not living up to its name ain't no fruit. So some of the sobering words that John the Baptist declared as he prepared for the coming Messiah. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But the gardener makes a proposition to the owner. Uh, This gardener, he said to the owner, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it, and put, fertil- put in fertilizer, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Just give me one more year. I'll do everything I possibly can to get this tree bearing beautiful figs that I, I know you love so, so much. And if it doesn't happen by this time next year, I'll cut the tree down myself. This gardener is pulling out all the stops in a year-long effort to save the tree, but that tree is on borrowed time. And by this time next year, if there's no figs, there will be no tree either. So there's a patience, and there's a mercy that will keep judgment at bay, but not forever. So the parable ends right there. There's no resolution to it. We don't know what happens. And Jesus intentionally leaves us in suspense as to what's going to happen to that fig tree. How will this season of second chances play, actually play out? Will figs emerge in time to stave off the woodsman's axe? Well, here's why Jesus tells this parable. And it's why this parable is a template that he intends for us to take and put over our lives today. Because Jesus knows that for us, there's a clock ticking. And he's looking for fruit. And if he doesn't find it, at some point, there will be a reckoning. But right now, we're in a season of second chances. But it's not going to last forever. The owner's going to come. He's coming looking for fruit. And with the passion that arises from the depths of Jesus' soul, he's pleading with us, repent, bear fruit, because the clock is ticking for you. This grace-filled season, it's got an expiration date on it. It's got an expiration hour to it. A fruitless life can only go on so long before it meets the ax. So there's something that Jesus knows in the first century that is motivating his urgent appeal for repentance to this first century audience. Jesus knows that unless there is repentance, a Roman army within a generation will come and utterly decimate his beloved Israel. And the slaughter and the scatter will happen to such an extent that it will take 1,900 years to gather enough of a remnant to rebuild that tiny little nation. The first century Jesus can look into the near future. He can see that horrific destruction. It's on its way if there is no repentance. And that's why Jesus, on one of his trips into Jerusalem during the last week of his life, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers your chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance is not a peripheral thought in the kingdom. Repentance, it's a cornerstone. It's a non-negotiable of the gospel that Jesus came to bring us. Jesus' first words of public ministry are, the, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And he says that right on the heels of John the Baptist, who'd been preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's why John the Baptist would say, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
When Martin Luther nailed 95 theses, ideas, points of theology that he wanted to, to, to discuss with other theologians, when he nailed that to the, to the door of a Wittenberg church in 1517, that's, that was the spark that ignited the birth of the Protestant church. And the very first of these 95 theses is this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. In other words, all of life is repentance. Repentance, it's that crucial. Repentance isn't just how you begin your relationship with Christ. It's how you continue and live it all throughout. And that is why Jesus says, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's the template that Jesus passionately yearns that you and I would take from his teaching 2,000 years ago, place over our lives, because repentance is the key to everything. It always has been. Repentance was the first word in Jesus' public ministry, the first word in John the Baptist's public ministry, in the first sermon of the church, the one that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, when this massive crowd asked him what they're supposed to do in response to his sermon, Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, Repentance, it's the key to everything. It always has been. And Jesus knows that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So repentance is not primarily a, a, a vague sense of guilt for doing something wrong. Rather, it's an acknowledgement that deep inside of me, I know and am willing to admit there is an insidious, malevolent self-centeredness that has roots that go all the way down to my core and those roots have wrapped themselves around everything. And the life that I now live, it's pretty much lived for me, self-centered, to promote me. And I can nuance this reality so that it doesn't appear to be so crass, but really at the end of the day, I'm always doing an evaluation. Every transaction, every relationship, Every decision, every interaction, every event, I always evaluate them by asking, was it to my advantage or disadvantage? Has my kingdom expanded or has it contracted? Repentance is acknowledging that's the way we think. And so when Jesus, when John the Baptist, when Paul used the word repent, they did not primarily mean, mean feeling remorseful or guilty for something you did or didn't do. Rather, it's meant to be much, much broader than that. The word repent is metanoia. Uh, and it's, it's a combination of two Greek words that together basically mean that you are steeped in a way of thinking that is above and beyond. It's the realization that Jesus has showed us a whole new way to live. And metanoia, it's rejecting this, this world's way of thinking and values and the, the way of thinking that normally comes up from a self-centeredness and you're waking up to a whole new world in which Jesus is Lord and King. True metanoia, true repentance in the biblical sense is inseparable from the person of Jesus and that's why Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's saying, unless you're joined to me. Unless you draw your life from me. Unless you think like me and act like me, you will likewise perish. There's a popular theologian and scholar uh, today. His name is N.T. Wright. He was asked uh, recently, what would he say to his children or grandchildren about Jesus? Not, not, not what you say to your, your students in seminary class. What would you say to your kids and your grandkids about Jesus? What would you say? He thought about it for a moment and he said, you know, I tell them this. 
If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And then go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually a part of the drama which has him as the central character. So if you keep Jesus as the central character, not just of a larger redemptive drama, but of the unfolding drama of your own life personally, you're going to want more and more for what you say to sound like what he would say and your actions to mirror his, your values to look like his. And when you do that, you'll discover that you are living a life out of repentance. So just to conclude a couple of action points, take your life in one hand, and, and the life of Jesus in the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke on the other, Give them both a thorough examination and then do it again and then do it again and again. And wherever you, you don't see the life of Jesus being displayed in your own life or wherever you notice things in the life of Jesus that you don't find in your life, then you say something's got to change. Something's got to go. Something's got to be different. Whatever it is, hone in on that one area. Bite into it like a bulldog. Refuse to let it go until something is gone. Something is different. Something has changed. And when you change, when it's gone, when it's different, that is fruit. The fruit that Jesus is looking for. And when you soon realize that you can't make that particular change happen on your own, you will be praying that the power needed to make that change or that difference will come from the very spirit that empowered Jesus to say what he said, to do what he did, and that that would be graciously given to you and it would empower change. So when that happens, patience supplants irritability. Words of kindness we we'll replace barbs. When deep-seated joy bubbles forth, instead of just having a dour spirit, you'll know that should the master come that day, he'll find the fruit he's looking for. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be more than just fig trees that bear leaves. We want to bear fruit. And so help us to go beyond that which is just appearance and really dive into the essential. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would shine a light deep within the interior of our souls, revealing the desperate need that we have of repentance because there is a self-centeredness that for all our lives has taken so much control. We pray that, Lord Jesus, you would assume the throne in our hearts, and that from your mastership, your rulership, your lordship, Lord, our lives would be led, our deeds would be done, our words would be spoken to the advance of the kingdom of you, Jesus. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.